Welcome back to our Ultimate Beginner's Guide, aka the University of Oxygen Not Included. Today, we're going to space. We've been hard at work creating a steel. In fact, we are up over a thousand kilos, or a ton. And since we still have so much iron, refined carbon, and lime, we're going to go ahead and click the forever button. This is a common strategy once you get everything down and you're confident that your refinery setup can withstand that much heat being dumped into it. And I think we're going to be fine considering all of this is still only eight degrees. In fact, this biome doesn't even look like any heat was generated in it. So now the duplicates will keep making more steel as long as we have iron, refined carbon and some lime. You may remember from our last episode that we did a lot of exploring. In fact, we've revealed just about every area on this planetoid, save one. And that is this giant space area. And there's a certain reason why we have to see how high it goes, or in other words, exploring it, before we start our introductory space program. So to start off with, we're going to actually break through this abyss light, just the same way we did before, and dig up. Now because we're going to be doing a lot more work up here, I want to put in some fire poles. Just like in our main base, having fire poles on this super long run is really going to help the duplicates get all this work done. It's especially going to help when we're building this new rocket and introductory space program because when they need to go home, they're going to be able to slide all the way down instead of taking the very slow ladder. Some other updates I've made in the background has to do with all this water. You may remember that yes, we're using it for coolant for the metal refinery, but anything extra is heading the long distance all the way back to what we're affectionately calling our retention pond. We're then taking all this polluted water, feeding some thimble reeds, and all the excess is going into a water sieve. The water sieve is cleaning the polluted water and dropping off the newly cleaned water into our primary tank. There's a small problem that you might run into though, depending on where you put your liquid vent. For instance, if you put your liquid vent up here, what would end up happening is all this polluted water would get cleaned and keep dropping off more and more clean water and eventually it would rise up over this mess tile and then end up making a giant mess down here. So there's a couple things we can do to combat that and they have to do with water levels. Because of the position of this liquid vent, this water is going to slowly rise and when this liquid vent is covered up with water, it will no longer be able to empty more water into the tank. In effect, stopping this flow. And that's kind of what we want. When this gets stopped, this water sieve will stop working because it will not be able to output any more clean water, which means the flow of the polluted water would slow down a lot, thereby ensuring that we don't run out of water in our retention pond. The other area that we need to be careful when it comes to water levels is here in this pond. And the reason why is because remember, this one is responsible for keeping the metal refinery cool. Additionally, the less water there is in here, the more the coolant from the metal refinery coming out of this liquid vent is going to end up heating this area. In fact, if we give the game a quick pause, we can see because the water is already dropping beyond this point, what little water is there is much warmer at 17 degrees. And it all has to do with how much water this cool slush geyser is producing. Right now, by checking the tooltip, we can see that it is dormant. And unfortunately, it's not going to have another piece of activity for 71 cycles. That's quite a long time. So the way you need to look at it is making sure that you have enough water here and enough water here for 71 cycles to keep feeding your oxygen supply. Now in this map's case, it's not too big of a deal and we made our tanks plenty big. So considering we have 112 tiles worth of about one ton worth of water, I know we have plenty of water to last that 70 cycles. If we didn't, we would need to start tapping into some other water sources to make sure that we're filling in the gaps in that dormancy period. With our giant fire pole and ladder done and the fact that we've broken into the space biome, we still have a couple more things to do before we can get work on that rocket. Right now, you can see there's very little oxygen here. And if we go look at our gas overlay, we can sort of see why. It's all floating off into the vacuum of space. Now, I don't want you to think of the vacuum of space as a real vacuum, because while, in my opinion, it's a little close, there are some things you just have to take as far as gameplay goes. One of them being that this gas is naturally just floating up. The vacuum itself doesn't have any sort of vacuum pressure, I guess is a way to put it. In other words, were this a closer to real life vacuum, 
it would pretty much vacuum out this entire planetoid relatively quickly. Instead, the way it works in Oxygen Not Included is any of the gases that happen to come in contact with the vacuum will end up getting deleted. We don't necessarily want that because we're literally just wasting all the oxygen that is being generated by our oxygen machine. So what we need to do to prevent that is put an airlock in place. The manual airlock will work just fine and can be created out of any metal ore. Now I'm able to put it here because all of this area here has a background. And what I mean by that is this little shaded area here is not considered a part of the vacuum natural space. And what I mean by that is this little area right here that literally looks like it has a background that looks different from space can hold environments such as oxygen, whereas the vacuum tiles cannot. And if we take a closer look at the gas overlay, you can see that the oxygen does get to the vacuum space tile, but then is deleted shortly after. The same thing happens with liquids too. If I'd ran a pipe up here and dropped all the water, say, down here, it would just disappear into the vacuum of space. With our manual airlock in place, we can see that the oxygen flow has stopped. Now some oxygen will get out as soon as the duplicates open the door and head out. And there are ways around that, but quite frankly, for as little time as the duplicates spend opening this door and running out, you're not going to lose too much oxygen to have to worry about it. Now that we're in the space biome, we can start planning out that rocketry program. But the first thing we have to do that I alluded to before is see how big this biome is. So we can sort of plan where we want to put this rocket. In order to do that, we're going to build what's commonly referred to as the stairway to heaven. And don't worry about the science of how tall this ladder is going to be in the vacuum of space. We're just accepting it. But the reason why it's able to work is, well, gravity still exists up here on top of the planetoid. Maybe it's a lower atmosphere sort of situation. Because if I take Lindsay here and move them across, as you can see, they're not floating away and they're not using any mag boots or anything to keep them to the planetoid. Once you build the ladder tall enough, you'll start to come in contact with a unbuildable area. In fact, if I took these ladders and tried to build through it, you can see it just will not let you. And while I will finish these ladders up all the way to this point, this now gives us an ability to see how tall it is from the top of our planetoid to the bottom of the unbuildable area. And the reason why this is important is because different rockets have different height. So if I wanted to put the rocket platform here per se, I would know that I needed to have a rocket that was less than 40 tiles high. Over here, I could have a rocket that is as tall as 58 tiles, which there isn't a rocket that is that tall, so we know both of these areas are pretty good. But there will be some times that your planetoid is all the way up here, and you just don't have a lot of room until you hit the unbuildable area. And in that case, what you're going to have to do is something like this, and bulldoze the entire top of your planetoid to make room for your rocket height. There's something else that you're going to have to get used to as you're building your rocketry program, and that is the introduction of meteors. When you start seeing all these sort of shooting stars and comets flying around everywhere, what you're actually seeing is meteors impacting the entire star map. If we go to our star map, we can see that there are meteors hitting Stink Alien. Now here on Vitalio, if we scroll down on the planetoid details, we can see there's no meteor showers forecasted. And that's because we did this series on a pretty easy map. But you'll notice over on Stink Alien, right now they're getting bombarded with copper meteors, ice meteors, and slimy meteors. To tell you the truth, these are a very good thing because it's gonna give you more supply of copper, ice, and slime. This planetoid itself, we don't have to worry about it too much. But especially at the early game, when you're going to start putting in some of your rudimentary space buildings, you don't have to worry too much about the meteors. I haven't been able to confirm this, but I believe the intensity of the meteors increases over time. In other words, the meteors that are happening at cycle 251 aren't going to do a lot of damage. The meteors that are going to happen at cycle 2000 are going to do a lot of damage. But take that with a grain of salt, because that is only what I have seen based on my limited observation with the new meteor system present in the DLC. You'll also notice on the star map that there's a fog of war, or in other words, tiles that aren't really visible. You can see that there's a bunch of question marks here. The only tiles that we are able to see as empty space 
are the orbits around the planetoids. In this case, it's Batalio, and in this case, it's Stinkalen. These are still remaining unidentified. So right now, we don't really have a reason to go to space, but we will after we put down an enclosed telescope. The enclosed telescope is normally going to be the first space building that you build. It's found under the rocketry menu and requires 400 kilos worth of metal ore. Because I know we're not going to be using this for very long, I'm just going to build it out of copper ore and not worry about it. If I were on a planetoid with more meteors, I'd probably build a better system for the enclosed telescope because the enclosed telescope not only reveals visible planetoids in space, such as these unknown objects here, but it would also be able to give us a warning whenever a meteor shower is about to happen. The same goes with the standard telescope. The difference between the standard telescope and the enclosed telescope is because the enclosed telescope is literally enclosed, it's going to give the dupes sunburn protection of 100% and partial radiation protection. And that's going to be our introduction to radiation. By clicking on the light overlay, we can see that there is light on this planetoid. Light doesn't necessarily hurt a duplicate, unless the lux gets very high. And when it does, and the duplicate's sitting in it for too long, the duplicate will get sunburned. But the duplicate inside the enclosed telescope isn't going to have to worry about that. A, they're in a suit, but B, they're in the enclosed telescope. That once again provides 100% sunburn protection. The radiation protection is a little bit more serious. If we click our radiation overlay, we can see that there's 125 rads per cycle happening on this planetoid. And it does not matter if it's day or night. In fact, if we click on this bird here who I've sent on a fool's errand and scroll down, we can see that they're absorbing more and more radiation. But because this planetoid doesn't have a lot of radiation, we don't have to worry too much about it. And the reason why is because here we can see that Bert absorbed 23 rads during their little mission out in space. But as soon as they went to the bathroom, they dumped all those rads out. In fact, using the bathroom will reduce a duplicate's absorbed radiation by 100 each trip. But if you don't take a precaution, such as feeding them an aquatic diet, which gives them an additional radiation resistance, or providing some sort of radiation blocking effect using tiles, your poor duplicates will end up with a radiation sickness, and that you want to avoid. The last thing I wanted to touch on in regards to radiation is this next level of research here. While outside the scope of the Ultimate Beginner's Guide, you might be wondering what the next path is as far as research goes, considering using the research station and the supercomputer has brought us all the way to this point. Well, to get to this next tier of research, it requires applied sciences research and that is conducted at the Materials Study Terminal. The Materials Study Terminal is unique in the fact that it doesn't require water or dirt like our two existing research buildings. Rather, it requires radiation and consumes rad bolts. And by using our radiation overlay, we can see where all the radiation is present on our planetoid. Yeah, the space biome has 125 rads per cycle, but there are other sources in and around your planetoid as well. Everything from shine bugs, to wheeze warts. And you can see this one wheeze wart is putting off more radiation than our entire space biome. So you'd literally put a rad bolt generator next to the wheeze wart and fire those rad bolts into the material study terminal. I've done a complete tutorial on radiation, so if you want more detail on that subject, please go check it out. With our enclosed telescope built, we need two more items. One being power and the other being oxygen. Even though the duplicates are in suits, the enclosed telescope still requires an atmosphere. So we're going to take a leg of this oxygen that we got from our main run and just connect it right into the telescope. Additionally, the telescope requires 120 watts. We can do the same thing by grabbing our existing power line and running it all the way up. It looks like Camille's ready to put in the last wire and gas pipe, so our enclosed telescope is ready to use. Now, when you click on Aaron's for the telescope, you'll notice that a lot of the duplicates say that it requires a learned skill. And that's because in order to use the enclosed telescope, the duplicate needs to have astronomy on the research track. As a special note, the astronomy says telescope usage, but it also means enclosed telescope usage. And after a short while, our duplicate will get the errand, jump inside the enclosed telescope, and very giddily start doing some of the research. 
And if we go to the star map, we can see the tile that the duplicate is revealing. And after a short time, that tile becomes revealed and they'll move on to the next tile. And they'll work around this in sort of a concentric circle. Let me go ahead and fast forward this and see what Pei is able to reveal. And just like that, after a few short cycles, we're done with the telescope, at least in this regard. You can see that four tiles out, all the way around the planetoid with the enclosed telescope have been revealed, revealing to us an annihilated satellite that contains an artifact, a ruined rocket that also contains an artifact, a sandy ore field that contains a bunch of materials that if you fly to this, with a diamond drill cone and a cargo bay, you could pick up some of these materials. But most importantly, it revealed another planetoid. This is Barquista. And with access to another planetoid, you get access to another host of vents and geysers that you may want to land here and start gobbling up. We can also see what biomes the planetoid has. In this case, there's a forest biome here that you may want to go grab a pip and some trees and start playing around with them. It also has a radioactive planetoid that gives you access to bees and a lot of uranium. So now that we're done doing the telescoping, it's time to put down our rocket. Over in rocketry, we grab a rocket platform that requires 800 kilos worth of a refined metal. Now here in the early game, it's not too big of a deal what you build it out of, especially considering the rocket platform itself has an overheat temperature of 2000 degrees. For simplicity, I'm just going to put it right here. And once the rocket platform is complete, when you click on it and then go down to new rocket, you'll have a host of options. Now all these modules that you have access to came directly from the research you've done so far. For instance, when we researched space program, it gave us access to the rocket platform, but also the solo spacefarer nose cone, an orbital cargo module, and the rocket control station. Up here at Artificial Friends, we gained access to Rover's module. And in this case, this is what we're going to be looking for so we can further explore that new planetoid. The big question for your starting rocketry program, though, is going to be what engine you are using. Starting off, if you're still sitting at Tier 2 Research, you're only going to have a couple of options. Namely, the carbon dioxide engine and the sugar engine. Now, when you highlight over these two engines, you can see their rocket stats on construction to include how high they are, what their burden is, their range, their engine power, and their speed. And there's a couple of trade-offs that if we go into the database and check them out, we can see. The sugar engine requires sucrose to be able to propel the rocket. They also have higher height restrictions, which means you can put more modules on them, but they move a little bit slower. If you go further down in the database, you can see what the module stats are and a little bit of math if you are so inclined where you can actually figure out what the rocket speed was going to be based on how many modules you add. But the long and short of it is, by taking a look at this chart that's available at the Oxygen Not Included Wiki, is you can see that the carbon dioxide engine does have more engine power, whereas the sugar engine has a little bit higher of a height, actually produces a little wattage while it's in flight, but they both have the same range. Unfortunately, on this planetoid, we don't have any naturally occurring sources of sucrose. If we wanted sucrose, we'd have to start ranching these Sweetles, and they would take sulfur and turn it into sucrose at a 50% conversion rate. But that would also require a better source of sulfur, because while we do have some, it wouldn't last us too long. What we do have, though, in abundance thanks to these wonderful coal generators, is carbon dioxide. And this pool here has collected quite a bit of it. Now the sucrose rocket might have an advantage over the carbon dioxide rocket because, well, you can put a bunch of sucrose inside the rocket interior and whenever you land on a planetoid, sort of refill it. But without an access to sugar, without some significant work, we're going to go with the carbon dioxide engine for the purposes of our education here. We select the carbon dioxide engine and then we can just click build. Once again, in the early game, there's nothing wrong with using some of these simpler metal ores. In the later game, you're probably going to want to stick to steel. With one of the reasons being is that all these other metal ores are much more difficult to come by than steel will be in the late, late game. As soon as we complete the carbon dioxide engine, or any engine, the rocket platform background will start to appear. 
This is the maximum height of your rocket, which is not going to be too big of a deal because all we're putting on ours to start with is a rover's module built out of copper and then a solo spacefare nose cone also built out of copper. Once you put those into place, you'll notice that the solo spacefare nose cone is unreachable and that's because we are going to need some ladders. Now, when you're deciding what to build these ladders out of, I recommend obsidian. Obsidian has a higher melting point than, say, sandstone, and some of these rockets are going to get very, very hot when they take off. So for that, in order for you not to have to rebuild ladders all the time, I use obsidian. And after a short bit, the duplicates will have completed your rocket, and it'll be assigned a name. This one is the Dazzling Sat 51, I'm guessing? We also have our completed rovers module, and if we scroll it down, we can see the duplicates have already dropped off a rover's lander and a rover. And we have our carbon dioxide engine. But most importantly, when we click on the nose cone, we're going to see a launch checklist. And as you can see right now, we don't have a destination set, nor is the rocket fueled. We also don't have a pilot boarded either. So step one, let's load up this engine with some carbon dioxide. If we go to the ventilation overlay, we can see there's an input for carbon dioxide. So we're going to keep it simple stupid and put a gas pump right here. I'm going to start extending some regular gas pipes. And just to make sure we never get anything that isn't carbon dioxide, I'm going to put a gas filter in. That'll be filtering out all the carbon dioxide with everything else being vented right back where it came from. Then we just connect the gas filter with power and the gas pump and then begin our journey with the very, very long gas pipe run all the way up. A little awkward building here and there, and then right into the bottom of the rocket. We'll go to the gas filter. Before everything's connected, go to unbreathable, click on carbon dioxide, and now the only thing that that rocket is going to be fed with is carbon dioxide. While the duplicates are finishing that, we need to start on another game concept, and that has to do with the interior of this spacefarer nose cone. Now, this isn't the only interior that you're ever going to have to work with. There is a larger one available later on the research tree. But chances are this might be your first rocket interior. Now remember, while the duplicates flying around in space, they still need access to all the things they needed while they're on the planetoid. Namely, oxygen, food, maybe a place to sleep, and somewhere they can use the bathroom. Now there is a wall toilet that we could use for their bathroom needs, but unfortunately the wall toilet requires plastic. Something we don't have yet. So we're just going to use a regular old outhouse. Nice and easy. We're also going to add a ladder right here. I'm going to put a couple of carpeted tiles. That way the duplicate feels all special and will get access to the tickled Tootsie's buff, which will help keep them stress free on their voyage. As for oxygen itself, we could do a couple of things. One, we can go back to using this wonderful oxygen diffuser. Unfortunately, that would require a little bit of power. And you may have noticed we don't have a lot of room in here for such luxuries as a manual generator. So instead, I'm actually just going to put down a storage bin and then go grab a bunch of this oxalite that we have access to on the planetoid and we'll load that into the rocket interior. While the duplicates are doing that, I wanted to take a couple moments and talk about a couple of specific rocket features. The first one is the change crew button. If we click change crew, we could assign a pilot and anybody else that we want to come running when we click this crew button. So for instance, if I clicked Catalina and pay and then clicked crew, everybody who was not a part of the crew would have to leave the interior and everybody who was part of the crew would get an errand to come into the interior. We do this before we launch the rocket. The destination we'll talk about in a minute, but the other one that I wanted to talk about is the interior building restrictions. We're going to activate grounded. And once we do that, you can see there's a little no-no hand sitting on the outhouse. What this means is a duplicate's not going to come all the way up here to use this outhouse because they are not allowed to use it. Now, as soon as the rocket takes off and is in space, the grounded tag comes off of all those pieces of equipment. Now, there are some reasons why you may not want to have the grounded tag. For instance, if you land this rocket on another planetoid, well, you may still want to be using that outhouse until you build a bathroom system on that planetoid so until that time happens, you would want to keep the interior building restrictions off. In this case, though, we'll leave them on. With our storage bin complete, I'm going to select consumable ore and then click on oxalite. And so all the oxalite that we have on the map will be brought to this storage bin. Because as it is right now, 
there isn't any oxygen inside this rocket interior. The last thing we need to do before we can put in a cot, just based on how much room we have, is drop off some food. Now, ideally, we'd have enough space to put a refrigerator, but in this setup, we really don't. Because it doesn't matter if you have a refrigerator if you can't power it. So for temporaries, we're just going to put down a ration box, put some food in it, and then deconstruct the ration box to be able to put a cot in place. And since we're feeling generous, we're going to put a couple of hangy pots in too. Something to note that I didn't even catch until it started flowing is it is so cold in this biome here that the carbon dioxide is breaking in the pipes. And that's because carbon dioxide turns into a liquid at minus 48. So in order to fix this, we're just gonna insulate the gas pipe that's holding all the carbon dioxide. Probably starting from somewhere just before the very, very cold biome. We won't have to worry about the temperature once it gets to the vacuum of space, because another interesting fact about vacuums is there's nothing for it to transfer heat into. With our ration box installed, we can select edible, and I think in this case, because we have so much muckroot, and muckroot's not gonna go off no longer how long our space mission is, we're gonna fill that ration box with it. So we go down to edible, click muckroot, and look, it's not the best space food, but it's not gonna be too bad, huh? We'll also put a couple briar seeds in the hangy pots. you also notice with oxalite dropped off to this storage bin, the interior now has an oxygen atmosphere and it's slowly climbing to almost 2,000 grams. I think it's about 1,800 grams where the oxalite will no longer be able to off-gas. And bingo, we're sitting at exactly 1,800 grams. So now when the duplicate is living inside the rocket interior as they breathe, the oxalite will release more oxygen and so the duplicate has an O2 source. Additionally, we've got 150 kilos worth of muckroot sitting here. Notice though that it says zero calories and that is because it is grounded. If we go back to our rocket control station and click none, you can see we actually have 120,000 calories or enough food to feed a duplicate for 120 cycles. We'll go ahead and click grounded one more time. We'll deconstruct the ration box, making sure that neither of our refrigerators have been assigned to pick up muckroot. Otherwise, as soon as we deconstruct the ration box, they'll try to bring the muckroot back to the colony. And now we can put on our final piece of the puzzle, and that is a wonderful cot. Now, just like everything else in Auction Not Included, there are about a bazillion ways to be able to set up your rocket interior. And I'm sure there are some other ideas that are more efficient than this design itself, especially when you're able to use the wall toilet and possibly including a ladder bed. If we take a look at our carbon dioxide engine, we can see that it is chock filled with 100 kilos worth of carbon dioxide. And by clicking on our spacefarer nose cone, we now see that the rocket is fueled. Once your rocket's fueled, we can now change its destination and be able to select where we want to go. And as we move around the star map, it shows you how long the trip distance is versus how long the rocket can actually go. Remember, if you were to send the rocket out here, four tiles, it wouldn't have enough fuel to get all the way back to the home planetoid. In this case though, we're only going to the orbit of this new planetoid. So we'll click here. And with that, the rocket will start its sort of launch sequence. Now all we need to do is find a pilot. Over in your skills pane, there's a skill that is required in order for a duplicate to be able to be a pilot, and it's rocket piloting. And it enables the duplicate to be able to use the rocket control station. And because pay is awesome, we're gonna go ahead and click on pay, and then we can change the crew of the rocket, making sure that it's only pay, who now has the wonderful pilot tag, and then click crew. Something to note before we take off and I start using this rover's module. Notice that it's built out of copper ore. Because it's built out of copper ore, the duplicates chose copper ore when they were building the rover's lander. The reason why I say that is because there's a popular strategy that uses a rover's lander and a trailblazer module and deconstructing those two landers to build a rocket platform on the new planetoid. In order to do this, you need to make sure that everything's built out of steel because Remember, the rocket platform has to use a refined metal in order to be constructed, whereas this rover's module is only built out of copper ore. So that strategy wouldn't work. Another strategy that you could use is by using the orbital cargo module. By putting an orbital cargo module on the planetoid, we could then load it up with enough necessary materials and drop them off to the planetoid for the duplicate that we've landed with the trailblazer module to then be able to build a rocket platform. And it just so happens that an orbital cargo module will fit here. 
But without further ado, it is time for our rocket launch. With everybody loaded up, all we have to do is click begin launch sequence. And then we'll zoom out a little bit so we can enjoy the wonderful launch. You'll notice now that the rocket went from being under Vitiliel and is now on its own. When we click it, it brings us directly to the rocket interior. Notice that the grounded tags are gone and Pei is still sitting in their suit. We can go ahead and unequip that suit now. If we go to the star map and highlight over the rocket, you can see that Pei is going to be able to get the rocket there in 0.4 cycles. Note that we could actually get there faster if Pei had a higher ability in piloting, which they'll gain over time by using the rocket control station. We could also put them into rocket piloting too, and it'll give them a plus two to piloting. And after that half cycle, if we look over on the planetoid next to Barquista, you can see that there's a rocket in orbit. One thing that's changed is now we can click over C planetoid because we have a rocket in orbit. When we do that, we can see the top, which is definitely going to help when we want to be able to land that rover or figure out where we're going to put a rocket platform in the future. But now that we are in orbit, we can click on the rocket control station and click deploy on the rover's module and then decide where we want to land rover's module. Now, rover can only do tasks that a duplicate without any skills can do. So, for instance, they'll be able to dig through some of this dirt, but they're not going to be able to dig through something that requires a skill in digging. But now that rover is landed, we can start queuing up commands just like we would with any other duplicate, such as digging, putting in a manual airlock to make sure none of the oxygen that is present in this cavern is going to exit into the vacuum of space. Rover can even build ladders. The one sad thing about Rover, though, is they have a short life. You can see when we click on them, they have a chemical battery of 180 kilojoules. So after a while, Rover's going to have to shut down. Fingers crossed that Clay does something about that in the future. And as previously discussed, Rover's lander here is made out of that copper ore. So if you're going to use the strategy of not using the orbital cargo module, using this Rover's lander and a Trailblazer module that does the exact same thing to a duplicate that we just did with Rover, and then building a rocket platform out of it. But we're going to do ours a little bit differently just to give you a couple more options. We'll head back to the dazzling SAT, change our destination again, and send the rocket right back home. The rocket makes it home, and we go back to our main planetoid, and you can see Elon Musk style, the rocket lands. Now, before Pei jumps out of the rocket module, we want to make sure that they're put back in their Atmo suit. That way, the suit gets hung up correctly, and they don't get burned by all the exhaust that is currently venting into the vacuum of space. Pei, put your suit back on! Sometimes they just don't like to listen. Now, you may think that if I'm going to send down the materials to build the rocket platform, why don't I just do that? Well, because Rover can't build a rocket platform either. The way you can tell what Rover can do is anything that you started with the ability to build and anything in this first tier of research. Anything beyond that, Rover can't build it. And that's why we're going to change out this Rover's module for the Trailblazer module. Wait till you get a load of this thing. We're also going to load our cargo module up with 800 kilos worth of refined metal. In this case, we'll use copper again. We're double checking to make sure we still had oxygen and food available in our rocket interior. Also on the checklist is we need to make sure our fuel is fully loaded with carbon dioxide once again. And then we can crew the rocket back up, make sure our cargo is loaded, make sure that the trailblazer lander has been built because the duplicates will drop off the materials and then have to build it. We'll double check our launch checklist. Then we'll set our destination back to the orbit here. And because I know this suit is going to be critical in the landing of that planetoid, I'm going to unequip it immediately. And then once again, launch the rocket. Over on Barquista, you can see that Rover's done a pretty good job with our exploration. And because we were able to find some oxygen pockets here, our duplicate's going to be pretty safe when they're landing on this planetoid for the very first time. We've also found access to dirt, so we'll be able to throw those in an outhouse. And we have a little bit of muckroot on board before we start getting some crops growing here too. With the dazzling sat in orbit, the first thing we're going to do is deploy our orbital cargo module. Now notice that all this goes everywhere over on the planetoid. For instance, we have some here, 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 and all the way over here. And each one contains that 200 kilos. So we're going to need rover to be able to build us access. That way our duplicate doesn't run out of air 
and has access to all the interplanetary payloads. And fun fact is Rover can even unpack the interplanetary payload that came from the orbital cargo module. And once he's finished, we have a little bit of copper. I'm even having Rover unpack all of these payloads. And then we're going to build a small storage bin, say right here, and have Rover deliver all that beautiful copper. Then we're going to put pay inside their suit, making sure they are in their suit before we select the duplicate on the Trailblazer module and then click deploy. And just like last time, we're able to pick where the duplicate's gonna land and they touch down nice and soft. Here's our wonderful pay on the new planetoid. Notice that if you go over to the bio tab, you can highlight over the Atmo suit and see that it has 68 kilos worth of oxygen. So we're not doing too bad as far as timelines go. Now all we have to do is have pay build the rocket platform and that was assisted by Rover who dropped us off all that copper. And to make sure Rover doesn't get stuck behind the rocket platform, we'll give them something else to do over here, like digging this out. With the rocket platform complete, even though there isn't a duplicate in here, all we have to do is click land here. The platform automatically prepares for the rocket, the rocket lands, and all we have to do to get pay in there is build a ladder right back up to the solo spacefarer nose cone. With that complete, pay now has access to the bathroom, the cot, and some muck root. We'll even unequip their suit, so the rocket kind of becomes like an Airbnb. At least until Rover and Pei build a nice little colony here. One last thing you might want to do on your new planetoids is put down a mini pod. For no specific reason, I'll end up putting a mini pod right here. And this mini pod is going to function the exact same way the primary pod does on this planetoid. Except after you activate it, which does require a dupe, Rover can build it, but they can't activate it. You'll now be able to print things out of it, just like you were at the home planetoid. In this case, we're definitely going to grab the algae, just in case we need to run that oxygen diffuser. Congratulations, you've colonized your first planetoid on the star map. And that about wraps it up for our ultimate beginner series. But rest assured, your journey with oxygen not included is far from over. If you're looking for more instructional material, I have done a lot of tutorials and a lot of Let's Plays that'll build on the foundation that you learned by watching this series. As always, please remember to like this video. That way there's a better chance that YouTube will deliver the content to new Auction Not Included players. I hope you enjoyed. Happy gaming, much love, and I'll talk to you soon.